Your church is involved in making a difference in the world. What, what kinds of things does Lakewood embrace? You know, we have a lot of great outreaches. My brother's a, a surgeon. He spends about five months a year over in Africa operating on the, the needy people. And so we support a lot of medical missions, you know, all over the world in our own community. You know, there's a lot to do here in, in America where we live, but you know, we, we have outreaches to our, our school systems, just um, helping underprivileged kids, mentoring young kids, and uh, going in there and providing libraries for them, just real practical things. Even from uh, clothing, helping people get uh, clothing to do the job interviews and things. But we're big believers in not just, you know, it's one thing for me to get up there and give hope, but we've got thousands of people that go out every week in the community and volunteer in really practical ways, and so I feel very blessed to be a part of it. How many people on staff at Lakewood? How many people does it take to make that machine work? You know, I don't know. It's hundreds. I don't know exactly, but uh, I've got a great team there, and I feel very blessed to have great people around me. Did I hear 3,000 children alone on a Sunday? Yeah, I think at least that many. Wow. Yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot of kids. The church I attend, uh, the pastor there served wonderfully for 19 years and has been called to a new role. And um, it's tough but the church will go on. What would happen to Lakewood if Joel Osteen was not in the pulpit? You know, I never thought about it. Only the I hope somebody's <laughs> thinking about it. It's a big investment there. Well, I think the thing is I've got a great team. I've got family around me and a great, great other ministers on staff, but uh, you know what? I know God would, God would take care of it, but you know what? I, I'm, I'm young and believing that uh, I've got years left, but we do have a great, great team around me, some fantastic ministers. Your children seem delightful. Um, what do you see for them? They're growing up in some ways the way you did yeah. in a ch very busy church culture. Yeah. You know, I'm excited for them. My, my children love God. They love being a part of the church and never, never had to force them to, to be a part of it. And you know, I just believe that they're going to continue in the ministry, ministry in some way. Our son Jonathan is away at college now and uh, studying film and television, sort of like I did, but he loves music. He's really involved in our college age band and ministry like that. And our daughter, Alexandra, loves to sing. She's here with us, so I don't know what it is. I, you know, my dad never pressured me to minister. He wanted me to, but my children are much further along than I was in terms of getting up in front of people, so I just believe God's got it all figured out. We just encourage him to continue to hunger and thirst after righteousness. I'm not sure if this is, you'll confirm this for me, I heard that when you give an altar call, typically 40% of the congregation come forward. Yeah. Is that right, It is true, it is true in the events on the road, at out the of, church. Out of the yeah. church, so. Yeah, the, yeah like outside the church, yeah, it would be, it would be more than that. And these are big events, like we're gonna do one here in Toronto. Sometimes it's 60 and 70% of the people. When I do the stadiums, it's 80% of the people. And it, you know, 50% of the people that come don't go to church. They don't watch Christian television. They're, you know, it's, it's a, you know, they don't know, they don't know to stand and, you know, worship. They don't do anything like that. So the events on the road are geared toward more you know, people that weren't Seekers. raised. Exactly. And so, you know, at the end, I'm, I'm very traditional and still giving them that altar call. If you want to make a public profession of your faith, and, you know, it's amazed how, I'm, I'm shocked at how many people stand up. When you invite them to come, what do you tell them they need to do to be right with God? You know, I tell them that they need to, first off, repent of their sins. They need to believe that Jesus raised from the dead, and then they need to confess them. And so I lead them in a prayer right there and encourage them to get into a good Bible-based church and uh, just believe that uh, today is a new beginning. Well, Joel, you are, you're a flashpoint and you know it, <laughs> but you're making a huge difference and um, reigniting the appeal of evangelism in America with your style. The world needs positive. Yeah. I see you as the happy, happy, happy side from Duck <laughs> Dynasty. You're the preacher version yeah. of happy, happy, happy. Yeah. And it seems to come from a genuine place. Yeah, this is, somebody asked me one time, well, why did you decide to be a positive minister, optimistic? And I thought, I had to think about it because I thought I didn't decide because this is who I was before. I mean, this is how I grew up. And so, you know, I really believe that life beats people down already. And so when they come into, you know, 
my meetings, our meetings. I want to do something to lift them up, not tell them, hey, I know you, you fell this week. I know how bad you are. I'd rather tell them, hey, you can overcome. You can break addictions. You can be a better parent. You can uh, become all God's created you to be. And I think that resonates in people's spirits, you know, a little joy, a little peace, a little victory like that. And so I just feel like that's who God's called me to be. Now, I don't want to rock your world, but I can't miss telling you this. You know who Bill Hybels is. Yes. Pretty well-known pastor. About three years ago, he was conducting a pastor's conference, he was a guest speaker, in Zambia. And the question was, what is the greatest threat to the church today? His answer was celebrity pastors. Why do you think he said that? I don't know. Bill's, Bill Hybels a good friend of mine, and I don't know. I think maybe um, people, I'm, I'm thinking through it now, maybe people look into to people rather than look into God. and so. I can see that, you know, possibly like that, but we try to turn people, you know, walk in a spirit of humility and try to turn people to the Lord. And so, you know, it's interesting because you never, you know, never tried to, tried to be a, a big pastor or anything like that, but you know, it's just the, the blessing and favor of God and just try to walk in it and handle the influence that God's given us. That warmed my heart to you. The fact that you really didn't want this. It's something God has done. What's your biggest challenge spiritually in this place really at the top? Well, I think the biggest challenge is, is staying focused and staying fresh and, you know, keeping, you know, hearing from God exactly what I'm supposed to do because there's a lot of opportunities and every time I get up there to speak, I want to make sure that I'm saying what He wants me to say and a lot of people are listening. so. I feel that as a, a responsibility to take time to pray, to seek the Lord, what am I supposed to be doing? And so I don't take it lightly. I, I don't feel it's a struggle, but as a, a responsibility. I don't want to take any steam away from the book that I'm sure people are going to want to purchase, but biggest key to going beyond your barriers? Well, I think it's, I don't know if I mentioned it earlier, I think it's, it's in our own mind. You have to break out in your mind. Believe that you can rise higher. You're not limited by your education or by what somebody said, by what label you've, somebody's put on you. You know, you have to take the limits off of God. I don't think you'll rise any higher than the way you see yourself. And so, just encouraging. I think that's a big key. I encourage them to. One of them is to pray bold prayers. You know, a lot of times we think, well, God, I'm going to pray for my food. I'm going to pray for protection. That's all great. But, you know, it's sometimes you got to take that. you got to pray with the dreams God's put in your heart. I mean, that's what we had to do when we got our new facility. God, we believe you've given us this new building, this possibility. And, you know, we had to pray some bold prayers. To $105 million yeah, later, it was yeah. ready for the congregation. Yeah, it was. And so it was, and that was outside of my normal realm. I mean, I'd just been a pastor for a few years, and I thought I never raised a penny in my life. I didn't want to. But I thought, you know what, God, I believe this is a part of our destiny. And that's what I prayed. If it's not God, then, you know, I know you're not going to let it happen, but I believe. So we stood in faith with that. But I, I just think it's the point being is you got to, you know, again, it's great to pray for your food, pray for your children, give thanks. But God can point, handle more than that. That's right. Pray yeah. big. <laughs> yeah. Well, Joel, the world needs light and encouragement. And uh, you are a bright light. I, I don't even think you, do you take a note up there when you preach? I have, I have some, I just, but you know, I do have some. <laughs> you don't need them much, I don't think. Well, <laughs> you're the real deal. Thank you. God bless you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Thanks for this time. Well, it's my pleasure being with you.